Thank you very much. And uh, so I'm I'm the one between you and lunch, right? Uh, so I'll I'll uh, uh, pick up where a lot of the previous speakers left off. Right. So we uh, uh, got a lot of background on how Gen X got discovered and. Uh, learned about Gen X toxicity, learned about uh, ongoing efforts on identifying where Gen X is uh, located in the environment, uh, including sediment and rain and things like that. So I got asked to talk about lessons learned and the path forward. So this sounds like a deep subject. So let's see whether I can live up to the task. Um, so almost a year ago, um, the residents of Wilmington woke up to this newspaper article that was already mentioned. It uh, was published online on June 7th uh, of 2017. And it was entitled, Toxin Taints CFPUA Drinking Water. And um, this article really changed a lot of things in this community uh, and also uh, in terms of the regulatory and policy environment in this state, I would say. Um, so this this meeting here is about the Cape Fear River Assembly, right? And I see faces from uh, all different portions of the watershed. So I thought I would uh, put this map up here. Um, the Cape Fear River is uh, an important drinking water source for the residents of North Carolina. About one and a half million people. Uh, get their drinking water uh, from uh, water bodies that are either the Cape Fear River or its tributaries. And in our group, we focus uh, a lot on two locations. Uh, you know, here is the Kimmores facility, so we're trying to learn more about uh, the impacts of the pollution uh, on the community that lives right around the Kimmores plant. And then uh, down here in Wilmington and Brunswick County and Pender County, uh, there are impacts that are felt very strongly, uh, even though you're located 90 miles downstream from this plant. So, some of the lessons. Um, so, we need to apply advanced analytical methods to know what chemicals are in our water. So, and this is, uh, as, as uh, Ralph already pointed out, not a trivial task, right? But the question of, is my drinking water safe? Or tell me what all is in my drinking water is still almost an impossible question to answer because we don't know what all is in the water, right? The universe of chemicals is on the order of 100,000 chemicals that are in commerce. Um, of the compounds that are regulated, there are only about 100, right? So 99.9% .9 of the stuff out there is not even monitored for. So, so we, we're flying blind in a, in a number of ways. Uh, also, you know, with targeted methods, you know, I and mean, if I would ask uh, you know, the utility, oh, go, go measure these 100,000 compounds, well, that, that's impossible, right? So, so um, but we have some tools that help us perhaps focus on what is important, right? And so I put these two paradigms on here. The, the old paradigm is basically targeted analysis, and, and that's what we have been doing. And if you do targeted analysis, you will only find what you're looking for, right? If my method screens for 30 compounds, then I can tell you, yes, one or two of these 30 are in the water, but I can't tell you anything about the 31st compound because I'm not looking for it. Um, so with the advances of uh, mass spectrometry and high resolution mass spectrometry, we're able to ask a different question. And the question is, let's see what is in the water. And so we do this non-targeted or untargeted analysis. And uh, that helps us better answer this question, what is in the water. And so I, I wanted to highlight this with uh, the PFAS uh, conundrum. Um, when you look at uh, the
this effort that EPA mandated uh, of the drinking water providers across the country between 2013 and 2015, which is called the Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule, or UCMR3, uh, that effort included six PFAS compounds. And um, I, I listed them here, the heptanoic, octanoic, and nonanoic acid, and butane hexane, and octane sulfonates. Um, and when you look up the data for the local utilities here in the region, the Brunswick County Northwest Plant, and the Brunswick County Regional Plant, and CFPUA, uh, you walk away with, well, yeah, there, there's a little bit of PFAS in the water, but it's not really a problem. Right. The, uh, the only hit on PFOA, which, for which there is a health advisory level of 70 nanograms per liter, uh, was uh, in one sample at the Brunswick County Northwest Plain, and that hit at 31 nanograms per liter. Other than that, there were uh, some detections of the heptanoic acid. Right? So if, if I were a utility, I would say, well, yeah, I, I don't like seeing these PFAS in the water, but we're below the health advisory level for PFOA and PFOS. So this is probably not a driver to change how we treat the water. But uh, when, you know, in parallel, at, at EPA, efforts were going on to tease out what else is in the water, through high resolution mass spectrometry, a number of other PFAS were discovered. And this is Mark Steiner's 2015 ESNT paper that showed this series of uh, uh, ether compounds. So we go from a mono to a di to a tri to a tetra ether compound. Well, these compounds were previously completely unknown. Right? There, there was not a single paper in the entire scientific literature about these compounds. So there's no way that anybody could have said, well, you know, um, is, this, is this in your water? These were unknown unknowns, right? There, there, nobody knew about them. So in, in total, in this 2015 paper, uh, nine compounds are described that uh, have never been really measured for in, in drinking water. And what stands out with all of these compounds is that they're ether compounds. So they have these ether, ether oxygen linkages. And, and so you know, if you're a chemical manufacturer, you could say, OK, well, the, the compounds that don't have this oxygen in it, uh, the regulators are paying attention to it. Let's, let's make a small change in the compound, right? So we add this one oxygen. It's a new compound. We know nothing about it. No toxicity, no standard analytical method. Um, so this compound will fly below the radar unless we use these non-targeted high resolution mass spectrometry type of techniques to, to hunt these compounds down, right? So it's a, a little bit of a cat and mouse game and usually on the downstream end of things we're uh, chasing stuff. So Gen X is this compound here. So if, if you look at the UCMR data, you know, so in CFPUA water, C7 was detected at very low levels. At this, that's that neon green little bar here. Right? So that was the slice of known PFAS in CFPUA water. The rest was unknown. And uh, you know, some of the legacy compounds were not detected by UCMR because the method reporting limits were considered quite high. Uh, so a lot of stuff was reported as non-detect when it was there. Um, but then also the C4 and C5 and C6 compounds were not included. So that's why they didn't show up on the radar. And then, of course, Gen X was the compound that uh, uh, was completely unknown, I think, to EPA at the time when they developed the list of PFAS for the UCMR3. So, yeah, and this is from our 2016 paper, which showed that uh, even very advanced uh, water treatment processes cannot remove Gen X from the water, which is, of course, also frustrating 
for drinking water providers. You know, if, if you invest a lot of money into your infrastructure to go above and beyond what uh, you really have to do, uh, and then you find out there's still stuff that's basically passing through the plant untouched, that's, that's frustrating. And the community, of course, is frustrated too, right? You're paying the bill and um, you're still getting stuff in your water. And, you know, it didn't just stop with Gen X. You know, for Gen X, we had an analytical standard. For these other compounds back then, we did not have analytical standards. And, you know, Gen X, uh, like I've said many times, was really only a very small fraction of the total PFAS concentration in the river. That little, tiny, barely visible slice of red, that's Gen X. Uh, the other compounds are the uh, perfluoromethoxyacetic acid, the dioxahexanoic acid, and the trioxaoctanoic acid, all present at higher levels than Gen X and also not removed by the water treatment plant. Right, so the lesson here is non-targeted analysis is very important to better understand what's in our drinking water. I hit the uh, end of the power here. So, so the next lesson uh, as an academic is publishing scientific paper is insufficient to affect change. So, you know, if, if I would have published the paper in ESNT letters and nothing else would have, uh, I wouldn't have done anything else, probably would just sit there still today as a paper that some scientists find interesting, uh, but that's about it. Um, so, you know, as academics, we probably shouldn't live just in the ivory tower is the lesson for me here. Um, so, so this was the paper, it got published uh, online in, in November of 2016, and it took six months until the public really became aware of it, even though I did try numerous ways to uh, bring attention to the issue in the meantime. So lesson three for me is that when the public and elected public officials, especially from different colors of the political spectrum, pull on the same string, things can change. And you know, I, I think that really the the success that we have here in Wilmington with respect to Gen X is that you know as soon as this article in the newspaper was published. Um, you know, from the mayor to the county commissioner to the public, everybody was displeased, to say the least, right? So, uh, and that was voiced very clearly, and, and I think uh, in the end, things changed very quickly as a result of that, you know? And so I think from a standpoint, uh, public health, this, this is a success story for the Wilmington uh, and uh, surrounding communities. Um, of course, this was very painful uh, because, you know, when this uh, meeting that occurred about a week after the first newspaper story hit, um, the Kemore's representative disclosed that the NX had been in the water since 1980. That, that was a shocker for everybody. I don't think there was anybody not myself, not Mark Schreiner, not Andy Lindstrom, that knew that, you know, that Gen X was a byproduct. You know, we, we thought we would look for Gen X because it was a replacement for PCOA. Um, so, so this certainly was uh, a very eye-opening. Uh, but, you know, very shortly thereafter, Ken Moores also agreed to start collecting processed wastewater and when you look at uh, the evolution of PFAS levels in the Cape Fear River, this was uh, Pender County raw water here, but it would have been the same for CFPUA or Brunswick County. Um, you know, and just before Kenmore stopped collecting the wastewater, this is what you were drinking. Um, we estimate somewhere in the order of you know 40,000 nanograms per liter PFAS of the stuff that we know, you know, there's a few other compounds out there that we're still uh, puzzling out. That's 
mostly Mark Steiner's work. Um, then, you know, um, about a month later, the levels had dropped substantially, uh, but you know, this blue bar actually had gone up, and Mayfion byproduct too is a, a pretty large uh, molecule. It's a seven carbon diether, um, and we think it's uh, probably quite a bit more biocumulative than Gen X. So this was a concern, and once mm -hmm. that data came out, um, DQ uh, talked with Chemors, and then the agreement was that Chemors also collects the wastewater from the uh, Nafion manufacturing process. And you know that led to further reductions in PFAS levels. So this bar looks tiny on this particular plot, um, but you know, this bar still, if you add up all the PFAS levels in, in your uh, drinking water, these levels are, are higher than what you would find in most other waters around the country. And, and this level is persisting, and so that's basically the remaining question here, and I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, so I'll put a shameless plug here. This graph is part of a a mini review we uh, are publishing. This, this paper was accepted. It's coming out in July in the journal AWWA. So we we put it in this journal to uh, uh, you know, raise awareness uh, for drinking water providers around the country. Uh, it's a summary that includes a nice contribution from Jamie, who you just heard on the toxicity of uh, soil chemicals. Um, so lesson four, um, this one is kind of interesting to me. This, this is not an engineering question, but more of a social science question. Um, but chemicals of unknown or poorly understood, understood toxicity might generate greater public concern than chemicals with more well understood toxicity. So the fear of the unknown is often greater than the fear of the known. Right? If I tell you, there's uh, a chemical in your water, and the risk for that chemical, uh, the risk of uh, getting cancer from drinking this chemical for a lifetime is three in a million. You might say, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll live with that. Um, but if I tell you there's this chemical in the water, and I know nothing about it, well, it could be anything, right? It might be safe. It might be very toxic. and, and so. I think the, the alarm bells ring louder when, when the uh, chemical is an unknown chemical. And, and sort of uh, an extra little observation here is a chemical with a name that's easy to pronounce and to remember resonates more, right? And, and so I just have this little slide here, right? Which, which chemical has received the most attention in Wilmington, right? <laughs> So we got Gen X and 1,4-dioxane and bromide. Anybody even worry about bromide? Yeah. Uh, I'm glad some of you do. Uh, you know, then we have things that you can barely pronounce, like perfluorodioxahexanoic acid and so on. So if, if, if it would have been in the newspaper that it's PFO2HXA, I don't know whether it would have gotten the same attention as when it said Gen X, you know? So this is kind of an interesting social science experiment I think that somebody needs to do. Um, and just to highlight this, you know, these are results from our uh, Gen X uh, exposure study. Uh, when you look at uh, PFAS levels in Wilmington tap water uh, towards the end of last year, you know, we, we have Gen X uh, here, and then, you know, we have these other compounds in the water uh, for which at that point we still didn't have analytical standards, we do now, um, then the red bars are all higher than Gen X, right? So even uh, at that particular time, the, the attention is on Gen X, but the dominant PFAS are really other compounds. So the path forward, um, you know, so I, I just, <coughs> picked a few things that I think are important. So new drinking water treatment processes are planned for CFPUA in Brunswick County's Northwest Plan. CFPUA will probably go with 
activated carbon, Brunswick County, perhaps with reverse osmosis. Um, the question here is who pays, right? So, and that's, that's again, an interesting conundrum, right? So, and maybe through the legal process, it will be Camors, but I'm not sure when that would all be completed, the, that lengthy process. Um, but in the meantime, you know, it's probably the, the public, you know, people's water bills will go up as a result of this remaining PFAS contamination in the water. Um, another important uh, to-do item is to characterize and remediate PFAS contamination in the vicinity of Kenmore. So, you know, as was already pointed out, um, you know, air emissions were an important uh, pathway through which PFAS entered the environment uh, near the Kenmore's facility. Uh, these, uh, you know, so Gen X-like compounds got emitted into the air. They get transported a certain distance away from the plant through wet and dry deposition. They are returned back to the ground. Uh, some of this, uh, some of the fluorochemicals will end up in the vegetation. Uh, some of it will percolate into the subsurface and contaminate the groundwater. And then, of course, we have the wastewater that got discharged into the river, and that impacted the communities down here. Um, so maybe I, I won't spend too much time on it. This was already discussed by Ralph very nicely. Uh, we have wastewater discharges, the Gen X, but then we also have the acid chloride that got discharged into the air, and then through the uh, water that's in the atmosphere or through rain, these compounds will be converted to the acid and then return as Gen X uh, back to the ground. So these are data from NCDEQ that are mind-blowing a little bit. Um, we got, and, and Ralph's perhaps even more. Um, so, you know, five miles away from the plant, 800 nanograms per liter uh, PFAS in the rain. Um, there are also some data where the, the rainwater was collected below the tree canopy and the PFAS level or the Gen X levels uh, below the tree canopy were about 4,000 nanograms per liter as the stuff washes off the, the leaves. So that clearly indicates that you know, the air emissions and, and the subsequent wet deposition is an important way the stuff spreads around the plant for miles and miles. And that has led to groundwater contamination, so people's wells are contaminated. I think the EQ and Kimors have in total now uh, co uh, collected water from over 800 wells, and more than 200 are above the health goal for the next uh, 140 nanogram per liter. The maximum was 4,000 in one well. So in, in our group, we were interested in fingerprinting this a little bit, you know, what water sources are impacted by the wastewater, what sources are impacted by the uh, air emissions, and we see two very distinct patterns. So the, the wastewater impacted um, uh, samples um, have a large percentage of this uh, perfluoromethoxy acetic acid, and uh, we see that really all the way down to Wilmington today. The, the perfluoromethoxy acetic acid is the dominant um, uh, contributor. Uh, in contrast, when we look at some of the other surface water bodies that are not impacted by the wastewater, we see a different fingerprint, and, and Gen X here is about uh, half of the total based on the compounds that we're looking for. So there's a, a sort of a, a fingerprint that's associated uh, perhaps with the air emissions, and there are very similar results that uh, you would also see in people's well water. Um, so there have been a couple residents who've uh, sent their water samples to a commercial lab and got their well water analyzed, and they see a very similar fingerprint to this. Uh, so in terms of 
remediating um, you know, the, the residents whose private wells are contaminated um, will perhaps receive uh, GAC filters. So that's in the pilot testing stage right now. Uh, these filters are fairly large. You get two in series. Each one contains 200 pounds of activated carbon. And you know, the, the Gen X broke through the first filter after treating about 25,000 gallons of water. So if you're a family of three, you know, maybe that corresponds to about three months of operation or so. So um, you know, if, if this is the solution, it will be a fairly maintenance intensive solution. So, of course, other questions uh, for the community is, uh, is PFAS also in the food. Uh, so, the soil is contaminated, the rainwater is contaminated, the groundwater is contaminated if you irrigate with uh, the well water. And so, people grow, you know, veggies there, blueberries there. Uh, there's been the report on Gen X in honey, 2,000 parts per trillion. People have chickens and eat eggs, uh, people catch fish, uh, hunt, uh, and of course there's poultry, pork, and beef also. So right now we're collaborating, this is Mike Waters, who a lot of you probably know through the media also. Uh, he's doing a very nice experiment to uh, puzzle out the impacts of soil and rainwater and groundwater on PFAS uptake into a number of different plants, so, so we're working with him on that. Um, other things, uh, what are PFAS levels in people, right? So that's a big question for the residents here who consumed this water for 40 some years. And uh, so we got funded by NIH to do a Gen X exposure study. This is uh, through the Center for Human Health and the Environment, which is a collaboration between State and ECU, and we've got some nice support from Larry's lab and, and from the Cape Fear River Watch and the Hanover County Health Department. So what we're doing is we, we collected people's tap water, we collected people's blood, we collected people's urine, and we're cranking through these samples now. We finished the tap water analysis and we reported that back to the community. Uh, now our postdoc is in the middle of uh, uh, completing all the blood analysis. Um, and we also collected uh, clinical markers. So even though the, the size of the population that we're looking at, we're it's just under 400 people, um, you know, we, we're trying to see whether there are any linkages to health outcomes. But our power is a lot smaller than that of the, the C8 panel, where you have you know, 60 some thousand people. A uh, couple more quick thoughts. Uh, should PFAS be regulated as a class? So, um, you know, this is the whack-a-mole game. You know, we regulate this. Oh, there's this new one. Um, so. You know, like Jamie already said, there's greater than 3,000 PFAS. I recently heard maybe something more like 4,700 PFAS. It, it doesn't really matter. It's already a number that's too large to regulate compound by compound. Um, so in the EU, there's a proposal right now to uh, have an upper limit of 100 nanograms per liter for an individual PFAS and less than 500 nanograms per liter for total PFAS. Um, so, you know, that's an approach that could be used to uh, regulate uh, PFAS emissions and PFAS in drinking water. And finally, we need to address discharges of additional industrial wastewater contaminants, right? And we, we are hyper-focused on Gen X, but there, there's really other stuff in the water. And so, you know, if we look again at the entire watershed, we have discharges of bromide and 1,4-dioxane in the upper reaches of the watershed. Uh, I just saw the, the recent DQ data for 1,4-dioxane in, in Pittsburgh. 
um, 65 micrograms per liter one quarter octane uh, within the last six months. So this is, a, to me, a huge concern. Um, milligram per liter levels of bromide in Pittsburgh's drinking water. Um, and that, of course, impacts drinking water providers all the way down to Wilmington, right? Uh, city of Wilmington have to think about changes in their treatment because of bromide. So we need to do, you know, we need to have a, you know, a, a wider uh, vision on, on uh, what compounds are being discharged into the river and are impacting our drinking water sources. So that's my presentation. This morning's paper uh, lays out an EPA move to have levels for Gen X without talking about the whole range of floral compounds. Are you, is that what you had in mind when you said that they're considering setting safe levels? So, and EPA, there is a meeting uh, yesterday and today to talk about PFAS contamination, and um, I guess uh, the EPA administrator suggested that uh, maximum contaminant lim limits for PFAS should be developed, um, but my understanding was that that might be limited to PFOA, PFOS, and Gen X, perhaps. So this class idea is not really one that uh, was at least uh, publicly disseminated. Um, it's something that uh, is discussed in some states, uh, but to my knowledge, not at the federal level, at least with official acknowledgement. But you believe it should be? Um, I, I think so, uh, because otherwise we just keep the cat and mouse game going, you know, and you, know, you change one little atom in the molecule and we start from zero again. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, as the alternative to bottled water, how safe do we know they are? Well, so the FDA regulates the quality of bottled water and the, the regulations for that are much less stringent than for tap water. And bottled water is a lot more expensive. I agree it's traffic waste. Um, I have a couple questions, but I'll start with one for Dr. Mead. Um, so uh, the legislation proposed by the Republicans last week suggests this non-recurring funds for the, the basically monitoring program through the university. My question is, if there's only a year uh, funded so far for this, and the, the mass spectrometry, ha spectrometry has to find a peak, do you think that if there are PFAS, for instance, that are not coming through the air or they're not in sediment that won't actually peak, that we'll be able to find anything? If it's staying static, we won't find it, correct? Like well, I, I think the emerging contaminant of the, of the observatory, which all three of us are a part of, um, well, actually all four of us, um, uh, it, uh, we, it, it, it involves other compounds other than just PFOS. And the mass spectrometer, depending on the analytical chromatographic source, whether it's GC, LC, and then the source, you can tune in to different classes of compounds. Um, so the short answer is, you know, just because there's not a, a response doesn't mean something's not there. You always want to go back and check, okay, well, is it really a non-detect, or is there something that I have missed? So you think you could then basically find, whether it's PFAS or some other emerging contaminant, without a site within a year study 
Well, the time frame, of course, is compressed, and that is something that we'll have to, you know, address when the time comes. But from what I recall, the initial bill that's before um, the funds, you, we have to have a final report July, I think, of 2019, but the funds do not revert back. So, of course, the science, much like House Bill 56, will go on. And then one more question for Dr. Mead, if I could. Um, so, and the legislation also suggests that EEQ get a triple quadrupole mass spec rather than a high resolution mass spec. Can you share your thoughts on whether or not that's going to be of any use to EEQ? Well, of course it will be use. Um, you know, the uh, pros and cons of different types of mass spectrometers go along with the questions that are to be asked. Um, you know, and I think that is a discussion that my colleagues uh, at the DEQ can, can, can have. Um, I'm not a politician, but I am running for office for representative for this area. So one of my questions to you all is, one of the comments earlier talked about uh, perhaps an issue with reluctance to enforce at the beginning uh, versus the path forward. If there's a limited amount of dollars, and we're putting an arbitrary 10 million, how much would you put toward, I'll say, enforcement activity versus continuing research activity? If there's you know, limited resources, not, if there's so much that needs to be done, what would you do? Question for me, I guess. <laughs> Hard to put a dollar figure on that. Um, yeah, my comment about a reluctance to enforce not necessarily about a resource limitation. This problem went back a long way, long before there were major budget cuts at, at the uh, I, I don't want to get too far down the road in what I think I know as opposed to what I'm sure of. But there is, to some degree, a behavioral issue. And you would have to ask the individuals involved the nature and extent of that behavioral issue. To some degree, it is about funding, and there's certainly a, an unfriendly environment right now for funding environmental enforcement. And the threat continues. Uh, be careful who you piss off. Um, but again, this problem went way back, and it is systemic. It's, it's not just the enforcement agencies. The technical ability to do some of these things was missing. When you get permission to produce a new compound, is there any requirement that a method be established for testing for that compound? No. That's a fundamental flaw in the system, isn't it? You can produce something we can't find. What could go wrong? I kind of, I feel like I need to say, is there a lawyer in the house? <laughs> because, I mean, when we say enforcement, I think we have to remember that these, the vast majority of these compounds, including the legacy compounds, are not regulated. So enforcement abilities are often limited by statute at both the state and federal level. So overreach by many of our regulatory agencies is just laughable whenever I hear that phrase because they're very limited by statutory authority. Um, I have a question for Detlef and, and Dr. DeWitt. Um, thank you so much for coming today. Um, Detlef, you mentioned the, the study that you're conducting in New Hanover County. And out of the 400, um, I personally have four of my family members as part of that study, so I'm very interested in the results. Um, but along with that, I'm curious of the outcome. I, I know you don't have the results, but you know, once the results are complete and the analysis is complete and those residents find out, you know, what's next. And I guess this goes back to something that Jamie, you mentioned up in the Ohio Valley was conducted a, a large scale study of, you know, tens of thousands of people were surveyed. Will that also be conducted in this area? Do you have tens of thousands of dollars that you're willing to share with us? <laughs> we, it, that's one of the challenges with conducting these wide-scale epidemiological studies is it, it, it takes a tremendous amount of money to recruit people, to give people a little something for their time, to do all the analyses. Uh, the class action lawsuit in, in West Virginia and Ohio was a pretty unique situation. I think they had about $20 million or 30 So they were able to hire 
you know, these epidemiologists to conduct all of these studies, and they also were able to to grow some of the existing data that had been collected. But I think we should look at this as a start to additional biomonitoring should we all get funding to conduct such biomonitoring. Uh, and I mean, we may, we may find nothing, but we might, might, might find, may find something, and that will dictate the type of funding that we pursue in the future. Let, let me just ask, do you have access to the Department of Health data on the So all of their findings are available online through their website, so all of their probable link reports are there, and we've also consulted with one of the epidemiologists, um, Dr. Kyle Steenlin from that team, so he's helping us out in terms of various health endpoints. Would we have access to those raw data? I, I'm not sure where those are archived, um, but we have access to the results of the probable link reports, as well as the scientific papers that they've published, which is, which is which are nice. I just got a, I got an email from a friend from undergrad out of the blue who works for a very, very small company that, that does some chemical work and he was asking me about this, this one polyfloral substance. He said, is this the same as some of these other compounds? And it was PFOS. And they're using it in their facility, but because they're very small scale, they're not recording. So that's a potential source of emission. He lives in Illinois but there are likely very small users and producers that are contributing that we don't know about because their, their volumes are so small. So if these chemicals are fairly persistent and they are found cosmopolitan and contaminant, <coughs> is it adequate to put in a local regulation that just drives the production to China where they're making plenty of PFOA every day? And India. Yeah, that's what's happening. We see shifts in, in production distribution, so lesser developed countries that are trying to grow their economies are increasing production, <coughs> and those will just distribute back over to us or to other countries. It's kind of how we got it here. Yep. The, the, the ASF got out of it, and we, we got it. Okay, one last question. I know we're standing between lunch and here. So, so this, this, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry is part of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and they do these toxicological profiles. And so they did a toxicological profile for, I think, up to 14 PFASs. Um, they, they released it in 2014 for public view and for comment. And they have since revised that and need to release it, but for some reason are not able to due to who knows what political reasons. Um, it's an updated report based on publicly available peer-reviewed literature and their interpretation. So the ATSDR comes up with something similar to maximum contaminant levels. And so in their previous iteration of that report, which is still available, they, they develop these maximum contaminant levels. So I would assume in their updated report, it contains information on uh, risks being, levels being lower for health risks than what they had in their previous report, but it, it hasn't been released, so I can't come up specifically. Okay, with that, I know um, lunch is waiting. First of all, um, let's give a hand for all of our speakers. <laughs>
Thank you all.